Hi, everyone. Uh, we're just going to wait a, a minute or two uh, just so people can join. Hi all, if you're joining just now, thanks so much. Uh, we're just gonna wait one more minute uh, just to get uh, a few more people to join. All right, I think we're gonna start. Um, so hi, thank you so much uh, for joining us today. My name is Sam Tellerico and I'm the Director of Marketing at Provident. Uh, this is actually our first webinar and we're excited to continue uh, these every month or so as we begin this webinar series. We have an awesome learning experience today with our host, Chief Ed Mann and our panelist, Chris Daly. Uh, if you have any questions while watching the presentation today, please type them in the Q&A box uh, we're going to have a live Q&A, and Ed and Chris will answer any questions you have. That'll take place in about 45 minutes. Um, at the end of the webinar, we also have a quick five-question survey, and we'd appreciate uh, all your feedback if possible. Uh, with that, I'm going to hand this over to Ed to present a few slides about Provident. Thank you, Ed. Sam. Yeah. Welcome to Provident's maiden voyage in the world of webinars. Uh, look, this is our first shot at this. If we have any technical difficulties, please bear with us. Sam, if you want to go to the next slide, please. So Providence existed since 1902. They started as an independent insurance agency in Pittsburgh. And in 1928, uh, the owners of the company saw a need to begin servicing volunteer fire departments uh, with customized accident and health insurance. Uh, they primarily did everything in the Pittsburgh area and eventually, and now today, we offer our insurance programs across the country. Uh, we provide uh, insurance to volunteer combination career fire departments, as well as emergency medical responders with a multitude of programs. We also offer a special risk policies and transportation insurance programs. Provident has award, been awarded the top insurance workplace by the Insurance Business Magazine the last three years, uh, which makes it a great place to work. Some of the programs we offer, we have an accident and health program. If you're an accident and health client of ours, you have the uh, advantage to be able to take uh, advantage of our first responder assistance program. We also offer a 24 accidental 24 hour accidental death and dismemberment policy, group term life policies, a critical illness and cancer policies. And then we also insure things with our fire plus property and casualty insurance. And if you're a fire plus client, you also have access to our online training platform called fire plus Academy. So today I have the honor to introduce Chris Daly the author of the book, The Drive to Survive and the Art of Willing the Rig. In a few moments, I'll let Chris tell you about himself and his career in both the volunteer fire service and in law enforcement. I first met Chris during one of, my, one of his many presentations at the Fire Department Instructors Conference and was always impressed with his ability to mix humor and factual information that drove home the point that vehicle dynamics play a significant role in crashes involving vehicles operated by first responders. So far this year, there have been several accidents involving fire apparatus rollover crashes, crashes, so the timing of this webinar couldn't be better. 
I'm sure you'll have plenty of questions throughout the program, and we're asking you to use the question and answer feature to send your questions, and we will attempt to have Chris answer all of them. Please note, if we can't get them all answered in our allotted time, we'll get the answers to you via email in the, in the, the days following the webinar. Uh, so at this point, I'm going to turn off my video and yep. shut my mouth, and I'm going to give Chris the opportunity to present his program. Welcome aboard, Chris. Thank you, Ed. I appreciate it. Take Can you hear me all minutes, right? Yep. Tell us, uh, take a few minutes to tell us about yourself. All right. So real quick, uh, for anyone who hasn't taken the program before, my name is Chris Daly. I hail from uh, Westchester, Pennsylvania, about 50 miles west of Philadelphia. Uh, I've spent the past 30 years involved in the fire service in some capacity, 23 years active on both the uh, career and volunteer side, just outside of Philadelphia. Um, in addition to that, I've spent the past 23 years as a full-time police officer. And as I always tell everybody, guys, please hold your applause. I know how much you love cops out there. Uh, and I specialize in reconstructing crashes where the guys come out at two in the morning, tie up your rescue truck for lighting for four hours. Everybody stands around bitching about what's taken us so long. We're the guys who try and put that crash back together, figure out who is going, how fast, who needs to be criminally charged, if anyone, and all that sort of good stuff. So to make a very long story short, what I started to see was a lot of emergency vehicle crashes. And a lot of those crashes were caused by the drivers failing to understand the danger and the vehicle dynamics of driving a large fire apparatus, um, which is why I ended up putting the program together about 15 years ago. Uh, there's a lot of different modules that the program covers nowadays, but today, as you said, we're gonna concentrate on rollover dynamics because as we've seen this year, we've had a large number of rollovers throughout the country. Uh, we just had one in a county not far from me about a month and a half ago, and I saw there was one recently in the past few days out in the Midwest. So the whole point of today's uh, brief conversation is to discuss rollovers, give you some tips, give you some ideas to understand why rollovers happen, and hopefully avoid them from happening in the future. Uh, what I'm going to give you today is just a very brief overview. Uh, as Ed mentioned, if you come to FDIC or if you go to the online program or if you're fortunate to see a program in real life, this module usually takes about an hour and a half to two hours. But for the sake of time uh, and the fact that this is our first webinar, our first experience uh, online, we're going to keep it somewhat relatively short. But I am going to give you all the facts you'll need to hopefully prevent a rollover in the future. So why are rollovers such a big problem in the fire service? Uh, a lot of it has to do with a lack of understanding about vehicle dynamics. But the problem with rollovers is that most of our serious and fatal fire apparatus crashes involve a rollover event somewhere in the crash sequence. As much as I hate to see rollovers happening, I will say this. I'm starting to see less and less fatalities as a result of rollovers, probably because finally the seatbelt message is getting through. So seatbelts is a whole other topic, but for today, let's concentrate on the rollover. So like I said, most of our serious and fatal fire apparatus crashes involve a rollover. And usually that rollover is caused by the driver traveling too fast for conditions uh, or making an inappropriate steering maneuver. They turn the wheel too hard for the speed that they're traveling and they create too much G-force, which you're gonna hear a lot about in the coming slides. Unfortunately, many of our EVOC programs don't address the vehicle dynamics of driving a large fire apparatus, right? And this is not a shot when I say this to anybody out there who might be an EVOC instructor, but as I always say, oftentimes you'll go to a Christmas party and you'll be standing there with your husband or wife's friends and they'll say, wow, you're a firefighter and you drive these large fire trucks that cost a million dollars. You must have so much extensive training to be able to do that. And you say, well, I went to an eight hour class called EVOC and uh, we sat in the classroom, kind of blew through a PowerPoint for two hours. And then we went out in the parking lot and uh, there was 25 people in the class. So when all was said and done, I mean, you really only got to drive the course two or three times. And then once I took that class, I went back and rode around with a friend of mine who's our chief engineer. And a few hours later, they blessed me to drive the million dollar piece of apparatus. That unfortunately is the driver training program for a lot of our country. And if it's not your department, great. That's awesome. I'd love to hear how you do it. But the reality is that is how a lot of our driver training takes place. So it's no surprise when these very large, very unstable vehicles flip over, rounding a curve, going 60 miles an hour, because the driver didn't understand the dynamics behind the vehicle. So today we're going to discuss one major issue. Usually, well, we'll start off with rollover crashes, as you've heard. The friction circle deals with low center of gravity vehicles. 
because low center of gravity vehicles don't typically roll over, but they do break traction with the road and spin out and usually crash on a curve. And that's a whole other discussion. Today, we're gonna to concentrate on rollover crashes. Before we get into that, I always like to show a video or two. Everybody loves a good Russian drive cam video. This is a good example of how easy it is to flip a fire truck over. And as you can see, it didn't take much of a hit to put that thing on its side. So we're gonna talk a lot about fire apparatus rollovers, not just crash induced rollovers as we saw there, but by the fact that the driver put too much, as you see here, G-force on the vehicle, causing it to flip onto its side. Now, most EVOC programs talk about inertia and centrifugal force. And those are very you know, scientific sounding concepts. And unfortunately, when the instructors get to that point, they kind of blow over it real quick because quite frankly, a lot of them don't understand it themselves. Not to say you don't if you're an EVOC instructor, you know, but unfortunately, a lot of it is a more advanced concept that people don't understand and don't know how to convey. So what I like to do, and as I try and reinvent EVOC throughout the fire service, I want us to get away from the concept of inertia and centrifugal force and talk about G-force because everyone has heard the term G-force especially you Gen Xers and the baby boomers that are still left in the fire service out there. We all grew up with Top Gun, so we all know what G-force is. Uh, you millennials, you Gen Zs, you'll have Top Gun too soon. Why you have to reinvent our movies? I have no idea. You always ruin them, all right? But our generation, hopefully the younger generation, has heard the term G-force. So that's what I want us to start talking about. There's actually three types of G-force. Longitudinal G-force, which works front to back when you brake and accelerate lateral g-force which works side to side when you turn the wheel and then combined g-force which would be when you brake or accelerate while turning the wheel and that would be pulling into a parking space or slowing down around a curve or something on those lines but when we talk about g-force as i always say you need to understand that there will be three points in your life when you drive the safest the first is the day you take your driver's exam the second is the day you drive your first kid home from the hospital. Not the second one. Nobody cares by then. You just throw the kids in the car. You want to get home. All right. And then the third time is any time you drive home with a pizza sitting next to you. Why? Because nobody wants to mess the cheese up. Am I right? I can't see you out there, but I'm sure a few of you are chuckling because I know it's true. When you accelerate too hard, the cheese flies to the back of the pizza. If you slam on the brakes, the cheese moves forward. And if you turn the wheel left to right, the cheese goes side to side. And by the time you get home, you need a knife to cut the pizza cheese apart in order to separate the slices, right? Everybody knows that analogy. That is what it should be like driving a fire truck. Pretend every time you drive that vehicle or ambulance or anything with a high center of gravity, there's a pizza sitting on the doghouse. And if you imagine that in your head, you'll probably drive so safe, you'll never risk rolling the truck over, all right? So remember the pizza analogy. If you guys are officers, you have drivers, I want you to yell over, remember the pizza, and hopefully those guys will understand what you're talking about. So that being said, let's take that pizza concept and apply it to a fire truck. And as I said, there's three types of G-force. Lateral G-force, which works side to side, and that's what we're going to talk about today during the rollover uh, modules. And then lateral G-force, which works front to back, braking and accelerating. And then a combination of the lateral and longitudinal, which is braking and curves and that sort of stuff. So today we're concentrating on lateral G-force. Understand that a vehicle, in our case, a fire truck or an ambulance, can only absorb so much lateral G-force pushing on the side of it before it will do one of two things. It will either roll over in the case of a high center of gravity vehicle like a fire truck, or it will spin out in the case of a low center of gravity vehicle like my police car. All right, again, today we're concentrating on rollovers. So, this is the formula for G-force. Don't freak out, all right? There's no test, there's no quiz at the end of this. You'll still get a certificate, so don't worry. But the amount of lateral G-force pushing on your vehicle is equal to the speed of the vehicle squared divided by 15 times R, which is the radius of the vehicle's path of travel, how hard you turn the steering wheel. So essentially, the amount of lateral G-force you put on the vehicle depends on your speed, and how hard you turn the wheel. You can see it right here in this formula. And who controls the speed and the steering wheel? The driver. So you control the G-force and you therefore will control whether or not the truck flips over. I would also argue in a good fire department, the officer also has some say in how that vehicle is operated. 
as well as everyone sitting in the back of that rig, because you need to understand everyone in that rig has their lives in the hands, the driver's hands. And if the driver is driving irresponsibly, it's okay to speak up and say, hey, slow down. I don't want you to kill me. I need to go home to my family. All right. So ultimately, the driver controls the G-force, but so does everybody else sitting in that rig. So that being said, lateral G-force, as I just said, will increase as the speed of the vehicle increases and as the curve gets sharper or the driver turns the steering wheel harder. As the speed increases and the steering wheel gets turned harder, the amount of lateral G-force acting on the vehicle will increase and it will make it much easier to push the thing over as we're going to see. So this is an important number. Most people will start to feel uncomfortable when the lateral G-force pushing on the side of your body rises above 0.2 to 0.3 lateral G. Right? And that is why we put those O shooting handle, uh, handles in cars and trucks. If your officer is routinely grabbing that handle while you're driving, you're probably not a responsible driver. Officers, if you're grabbing the handle, it's probably time to say something to your driver, okay? But as lateral G-force increases, people start to feel uncomfortable. And if we train this properly, that can actually get used as a very good driver training or EVOC uh, methodology when it comes to understanding G-force. You have to excuse me, it's very dry here in PA today, so I'm going to take a sip of water. So with that being said, most fire trucks will roll over when the lateral G-force rises above 0.5 to 0.6 lateral G. So as the G-force increases, you'll start to feel uncomfortable. As it continues to rise, eventually your fire truck will flip over. And in a vehicle with a low center of gravity, while it won't flip over, if the G-force continues to rise, the vehicle's tires will eventually break traction with the road and you will spin out. And again, that's a concept known as the friction circle. So in summary, as the lateral G-force increases, we feel uncomfortable. Our fire truck will probably roll over eventually. And then our low center of gravity vehicle, like a car, will eventually spin out, break traction with the road and spin off the highway. Now, the amount of lateral G-force a vehicle can absorb before it flips over is called the rollover threshold. That will tell you how stable the vehicle is. The rollover threshold is a relationship between how high your center of gravity is and the track width, which is the distance between the center of your rear wheels, or in our case, the center of our dual tires. So as the center of gravity gets higher, the vehicle gets more unstable. Now, before we go on, let's talk about something else. I'm sure most of you have seen a quarry dump truck. They're huge, they're like 30 or 40 feet tall, right? But they don't roll over every day in quarries. Why? Because they're very wide. So by making the vehicle very wide, the vehicle is still stable, even though it has that very high center of gravity. The problem is we drive fire trucks and we drive them on regular roads. So we can only make the fire truck so wide. However, as the function of the truck changes, water tankers or tenders, depending on which side of the country you're on, rescue trucks, ladder trucks, et cetera, as that center of gravity rise, rises up above the ground higher and higher, we can only make the truck so wide so the truck gets more and more unstable. Right? And that is very important for us to understand. Depending on the type of truck you're driving, all fire trucks are unstable, but some of them are even more unstable than others because they have such a high center of gravity. And this picture here will show you this. We can probably agree that the brush truck on the left has a lower center of gravity and is therefore more stable than the fire truck, the quint on the right, because that quint has a higher center of gravity. So the brush truck can absorb more lateral G-force before it flips over. It has a higher rollover threshold than the quint on the right, which has a much higher center of gravity. Now, how do we calculate these rollover thresholds real quick? I can tell you from having gone to firehouses and actually measuring the distance between the center of the duels, most fire trucks have a track width, a distance between the center of the duels of about 74 inches, give or take here and there, depending on the design of the truck, who makes it, et cetera. But 74 inches is a pretty good uh, benchmark, let's say. It's very easy to figure out the track width of your vehicle, but it's much more difficult to determine the height of the center of gravity. To do that, you need to bring in a tow truck. You need to lift the front end of the truck up and weigh it. You need to lift the back end up and weigh it. It can be very complicated. However, there was an instance out in the West Coast 
uh, in Nevada where a, uh, a snozzle in this case rolled over on an exit ramp. During the investigation, the Nevada State Police Highway Patrol, sorry, I don't know which one they are out there, but nonetheless, they wrote a letter to the manufacturer and they said, could you tell us how high the center of gravity of this truck is? And sure enough, the manufacturer responded and said, the center of gravity of this truck is 65 inches off the road. So by knowing the track width, as well as the height of the center of gravity, the trooper was able to determine the rollover threshold of this vehicle, which was 0.56 lateral G. What this means is, if this vehicle experiences anything greater than 0.56 lateral G pushing on the side of the vehicle, it will roll over. And that's a very important teaching concept. Let's go to this example. This was a, uh, a type three wildland pumper engine, whatever you wanna call it out on the West Coast again, I believe. Um, and a state agency was gonna buy a bunch of them. So they did a bunch of testing beforehand. And as part of the testing, they tilt tested this. And if you've ever seen that before, what they do is they have a giant table they take the truck, they chain it to the table, and they start to tilt the table from one side to the other. And they take note of at what angle that vehicle starts to roll over. And that allows them to calculate the rollover threshold of the vehicle. In this case, the fire truck rolled over when it was tilted 29 degrees one way and 29.7 degrees the other. That equates to a rollover threshold of 0 0.55 and 0 0.57 which again is right in between that 0.5 and 0.6 lateral G rollover threshold we talked about generally in the beginning of the, of the module. So what this tells us is that if this vehicle experiences greater than 0.55 lateral G one way or 0.57 the other, it will flip over onto its side. So it's very important for us to keep the amount of lateral G force below that threshold. Now, some of you might be asking, why is it different one side Chris, we just lost your sound. Can you hear me now? We can hear you now, Chris. All right, where did you lose me at? I think that we start this slide and we should be good. All right, I apologize. My, my microphone's green and everything else. That's why I like classrooms better, Ed. I'm sorry. It might have been just a Wi-Fi thing, but it, we're, we, we're good for now. All right. So Thanks. I'll start over with this slide. Type 3 wildland pumper. They did a bunch of tests and determined that the rollover threshold for this truck was 0.55 one way, 0.57 the other. That means that if it absorbs anything greater than 0.55 lateral G in one direction or 0.57 in the other direction, the truck will flip over. This is the rollover threshold. Some of you may be asking yourselves, why is it a little bit different one way versus the other? Depends on the design of the truck. If it has a L-shaped tank, uh, if the pump panel is heavier on one side than the other, it could cause an issue uh, where you have you know, a little bit more stability on one side versus the other. In the end, when you do the math, it barely works out to any speed difference. But again, just a point of trivia. So the reason I show you guys this is this is a very important teaching point. These are the rollover thresholds of different types of vehicles. So a passenger car averages around a 1.4, pickup truck around a 1.1, and you can see the fire trucks around a 0.5 to a 0.6, considerably less stable than your regular car. This is why the kid comes wheeling into the firehouse in his Honda Accord, having just traversed the curve out front at 65 miles an hour, runs into the firehouse, puts his or her gear on, gets behind the wheel of the engine, pulls out, drives through the same curve at the same speed and flips the thing over because the vehicle dynamics of that vehicle have changed tremendously. And this is something every fire apparatus operator needs to understand. You're not driving your personal vehicle. Even though the modern day trucks look really similar to a car when you get into the cockpit, let's call it, because everything's touch button, you know, everything has real fancy displays, it's still a very heavy, unwieldy fire truck. When I started, I'm sure when Ed started and you were double clutching a CF Mac, you knew you were driving a fire truck, you remembered it. However, nowadays, it's much easier to get behind the wheel and forget you're driving a huge ladder truck, water tender, whatever you want to call it. So this, again, is why fire apparatus are so much more unstable compared to our regular cars, and we need to remember that. 
So I've said it three times, but if the amount of lateral G-force, the G-force you create pushing on the side of the truck exceeds your rollover threshold, you'll flip over. It's a very simple concept. So let's look at it in real life. This is a curve in Chester County. It's State Route 162. If anybody's familiar with this area, it connects West Chester to Coatesville. This curve, unfortunately, I've gone to numerous times for fatal crashes. So I had all sorts of data from it, scale diagrams. I knew the radius of the curve, how sticky the road was, all that sort of good stuff. So this is an overhead view. You can see it's somewhat of a dog leg, but it's not real severe, especially while you're rounding it. It's deceptive, if you will. But what I was able to do is take this curve radius, all right, how sharp the curve is, which is 320 feet, and I created a table. And as you can see in this table, I was able to calculate different speeds, 10, 15, 20, 25. It's the same curve, the same radius, but I was able to figure out how much G-force you would experience while you rounded this particular curve at different speeds. And as you can see at 35 miles an hour, as we round this curve, we're pulling about 0.26 lateral G, pushing on the side of the truck, pushing on the side of our bodies. And you may remember from one of the first slides, this is where you'll start to feel uncomfortable. Most drivers will sense that lateral G-force in that range and start to say, you know what? Probably going a bit too fast. I should hopefully probably start to slow down. As you go through the curve at higher speeds, when you hit 50 miles an hour, you see we're starting to pull 0.52 G. This is right around the rollover threshold of most fire apparatus. So if you round this curve at 50, you're probably going to flip the thing onto its side. An important thing to take note here is the difference in speed between feeling uncomfortable and rolling over is only 15 miles an hour. So there's not much of a warning to say to yourself, hey, I feel like we're going too fast and then try and reduce your speed because it's going to be too late. You're probably going for a ride, which is why it's so important to slow down well in advance of that curve and take the curve at a nice safe speed. As I tell everyone, always try and avoid going over 0.2 lateral G. If you stay under 0.2, you'll probably be relatively safe on a dry road, all right? And that would be, in this case, 25 to 30 miles an hour. Come back to that in a little bit. So as the curve gets sharper, that comfort speed and that rollover speed get closer together. And this, again, is a very important teaching point that everybody should understand, because this is why so many fire trucks roll over turning at 90 degree intersections or roll over in parking lots, driver training on a brand new fire apparatus. Because as you get into a tighter and tighter turn, it takes less and less speed to generate enough G-force to flip you onto your side. So let's take a look at a real life example. High Street and Market Street, downtown Westchester, Pennsylvania, where I work. Typical 90 degree urban intersection. The radius of this curve here is 30 feet, all right? So if we come north on High Street, turn right on Market Street, we're taking about a 30 foot curve radius. When we do our table, we see that if we round that 90 degree curve at 11 miles an hour, we're pulling 0.27 G, we're starting to feel uncomfortable. At 15 miles an hour, we're pulling 0.5 G, we're at that rollover threshold for most fire apparatus. The difference in speed between feeling uncomfortable and rolling over is only four miles an hour you have almost no warning whatsoever. And I think we can all agree that if we were to, you know, hit a pothole in a modern day fire apparatus with an air ride cushion seat, I'm sure we've all done it, and your foot comes down a little bit hard on that accelerator pedal, and a goose that gas pedal, you could very easily give yourself that extra four miles an hour, which will cause the thing to roll over. Or what happens if you suddenly have to turn the wheel to avoid a pedestrian who walked against the don't walk sign? Could you just create a smaller curve radius and thus increase that uh, lateral G-force to a point which rolls you over? And again, twice, maybe three times last year, I recall instances where brand new fire trucks rolled over in parking lots during driver training. Because what happens is you get a brand new fire truck, the thing drives like a dream. It doesn't take much goosing of that accelerator pedal to get an extra four or five miles an hour. And when you're turn taking a tight turn to see what it can do in a parking lot, Give it an extra four or five miles an hour, as we see here, it could be enough to flip the truck over. So this, again, is why it's so imperative to understand lateral G-force, to make sure you're keeping that truck below 0.2 lateral G or even less, because the less lateral G, the lower the lateral G-force, the safer you'll be, the less likely you are to roll that thing over. So here's an example I was floating around the internet, shows you how easy it is to roll over in a parking lot. This is a video from Europe.
probably not the demonstration I think they wanted to give to the crowd, right? But nonetheless, that shows you how easy it is to roll over in a parking lot. So that being said, it's also important when we talk about lateral G-force to discuss weight shift or slosh. You know, and you always hear in EVOC, weight shift's bad, and they don't really explain why. Here is the down and dirty as to why weight shift is so bad. As we round a curve, in this case to the right, in the other case to the left, we can agree that that lateral G-force, formerly known as centrifugal force, will push your chassis out to the side, right? And we're gonna sink down on our suspension because the vehicle rides on springs and shocks and all that sort of good stuff. Well, as that vehicle pushes out to the side, what ends up happening is your center of gravity will shift. If the center of gravity shifts toward the outside of the curve, can we agree we're reducing our track width on that side of the vehicle? And as we said earlier, as the track width gets more narrow, the truck becomes less stable. And this is why weight shift is bad. Not only is that lateral G-force actively trying to push you over, it's reducing your rollover threshold and making it easier to do so. So this is why we need to make sure we mitigate or reduce that weight shift while rounding curves. I often have people come up to me after class and say, hey, you didn't talk to about, you know, apex and curves or any of that stuff that we learned, you know, watching NASCAR or whatever. You're not driving a NASCAR vehicle. You should not be trying to shift the weight and increase the footprint of your right front tire to get better traction. You're not driving a stock car. Your goal is to keep this truck as level as possible, rounding that curve, so you don't reduce your track width on one side of the vehicle, making it easier to flip the thing onto its side. This is especially important for vehicles that carry water, okay? Now, most of us, you know, and I always say on the East Coast, the way we operate firefighting wise, typically our tanker task force will run a tanker fully loaded to a dump site, dump the water, drive empty to a fill site, fill up and go back and forth. That water load is still dangerous, don't get me wrong. And you guys probably know we put baffles in tanks to try and absorb some of that slosh to mitigate that weight shift. But where this really becomes an issue, especially when I travel out West and teach on the West Coast, you guys out West get all sorts of these crazy brush fires and you're probably pumping and rolling on a regular basis. And if you have a half full or half empty, depending on your point of view tank, and that water is continually sloshing around, your center of gravity is constantly moving around like a pendulum, front, back, left, right, side to side. What is your stability constantly doing? That rollover threshold is constantly changing. And this is why a partially full tank is so dangerous. So make sure if you're driving in a pump and roll situation, you keep that in mind and you do your best to lessen or mitigate the amount of G-force you put on that vehicle to reduce that weight, that water slosh. For you guys on the East Coast and up north who may you know, be familiar with brining the roads, PennDOT out where we live, they love to spray salt all over the roads before a big storm. A good driver training exercise, believe it or not, is to put a few driver trainees in an engine or even just a vehicle, follow a brine truck and watch that partially loaded tank. Usually those tanks are translucent. You can see that brine going all over the place in that tank. And that will give your driver trainees a visual idea of how dangerous it is to drive a water load especially a partially full or partially empty, as I said, depending on your point of view, water load. So can we create a curve in an otherwise straight road? Yes, very simply by turning the wheel. And this happens very often during an evasive maneuver or an overcorrection. And we see this unfortunately all the time in the fire service where the driver's driving down a straight road, they drift off the right side of the road for whatever reason, they're distracted, maybe they reached over to the radio instead of letting the officer do his job or her job. And as a result, the truck drifts off the right side of the road. What ends up happening is uh, roads are supposed to be designed to have a taper, like a 45 degree taper on the side, so that if you drive off the road, it's easy to bring your, your tires back onto the regular highway. The problem is, I know in Pennsylvania, after the first winter, that taper essentially disintegrates. And now you have a huge lip of asphalt, usually a couple of inches. Your tire drops off the asphalt. It's now scrubbing on the inside of that asphalt lip. The driver's trying to turn the wheel, but the tire can't mount the, back up onto the highway because that asphalt lip is in the way. The driver keeps turning the wheel harder and harder. Eventually they turn the wheel hard enough to where the tire is able to roll over that asphalt lip. But now where are you headed? You're headed into the oncoming lane. The driver does the only natural thing. They crank the wheel back to the other side. They create a very tight turn radius in this otherwise straight road. Depending on their speed, they may generate enough lateral G-force to flip the truck onto its side, causing it to enter a roll. 
Usually the rest of the report reads that the unrestrained occupant was ejected and flung in front of the fire truck and the truck rolled right over top of him or her. So unfortunately, this is a very common scenario. What I always say, if you drive off the right side or the left side of the road, stop the truck. It is not worth the risk of rolling the truck over to save 15 or 20 seconds trying to bring it on at a highway speed. Slow down, stop, get your wits about you, regain control of the situation, and then gently get yourself back up onto the highway. You may need a tow truck to do it, who knows? But be very wary of once you drift off the highway, getting into this overcorrection scenario because it happens over and over and over again across the country. And as I said, this is especially true on rural roads. You know, in Pennsylvania, this is typically the kind of shoulders we're looking at. There isn't one. If you go off this road, you know, you hit a culvert or something along those lines, you're going for a ride. And all you need to do is sign up for the newsletters, uh, the various publications, and every week you'll see a fire truck roll over somewhere, usually on a rural road with no shoulder because the truck drifted off the side of the road. So let's take a quick look at a case study. Uh, this one comes from the Oshkosh website. It's a crash truck. I like this one because there's a lot of really good hard data to prove everything that we're talking about. It shows that I'm not crazy in one way or the other. Some could argue that, but nonetheless, the vehicle involved in this uh, particular crash had been tilt tested to 30.44 degrees on this tilt table, which you can see here, which equates to a rollover threshold of 0.587. So if this truck absorbs anything greater than 0.587 lateral G, it will roll over. All right. And I'm making that overly simplistic. There might be some engineers on here who say, you know what, you have to account for the truck sinking into its suspension and all that sort of stuff. I get that. But from a driver training standpoint, we're going to say anything greater than 0.587 and this thing's going to roll over. So this particular airport, as you can see, is a very complex airport. This vehicle was going from this uh, fire station down a taxiway to an access road. As they were rounding the access road, they took this curve, which had a radius of 232 feet. And as the driver and the vehicle started around the curve, the vehicle lost control. And as you can see here from the tire marks, came off the road, back onto the road, overcorrected and flipped over, unfortunately landing here. Fortunately, nobody was seriously injured as I understand it. So when we take a look at this, this was uh, uh, an interesting crash because there is a video camera. The vehicle is equipped with a video camera and it tells us the vehicle is traveling 47 miles an hour when it initially lost traction with the road. So if we take this table that you saw earlier, we know the radius of that curve on that access road. We take different speeds. When we calculate 47 miles an hour, we see that that vehicle is pulling 0.63 lateral G as it rounded the curve. We know from tilt testing, the rollover threshold of the vehicle is 0.58. They exceeded the rollover threshold of the vehicle. Should be no surprise that the truck flipped over onto its side. So this is a great demonstration of everything that we've been learning. Okay, so how do we apply this to real life? When we do the full module, the full rollover module, we get into some driver training ideas. Um, unfortunately, we don't have time today to do that. But what I will do is give you a real down and dirty, quick eye way of applying this in real life. Let's look back at this road, Stroudsburg Road, which we saw earlier. The curve advisory speed, the yellow and black sign says 25 miles an hour. All right, and this was posted by PennDOT, PennDOT, Pennsylvania Department of Transportation. And when you take that 25 mile an hour uh, curve advisory speed, we see that you'll only be pulling 0.13 lateral G through the curve. Is that a safe amount of lateral G for a fire truck? Yes. So if your drivers heed those uh, black and yellow signs before entering a curve, you will most likely be able to travel that curve in a very safe fashion. In theory, you could take every curve in your district and pre-plan the speed for every curve. Is that feasible? No, but you could if you wanted to, just like we pre-plan buildings and everything else. So that's just one way you can apply this in real life. So as I always say, remember, you control the G-force, all right? The sad thing is there's 104 participants today. I know that every single one of you is probably a responsible driver because you took the time to attend this. The ones who really need this message are the ones who don't take these types of classes and you all know who they are and you're gonna to have to go bang them over the head a couple of times and explain this. So with that being said, you control the G-force, you control the steering wheel, you control the accelerator pedal, make sure you mitigate, you lessen the amount of lateral G-force you put on your vehicle and hopefully that will prevent you from rolling the truck over. A lot more to this, as I said, but this is hopefully enough to get you going. Um, Ed, if you want to jump on here, we can start talking about some of uh, the different 
uh, questions that we got. Hopefully, you know, it was a quick overview, but hopefully the, the message got through. This is my email. If anyone has questions in the future that go beyond the question and answers on this particular uh, program today, you're more than welcome to reach out, send me an email or call me. I would be glad to help you out. And also I've been posting little quick hits, I call them two minute, three minute videos on YouTube. Uh, if you Google or YouTube Drive to Survive, which will reiterate some of what you learned today, as well as some other topics. And uh, my theory there is the people who attend these types of classes can take those two minute videos, show it to the drivers who need them. And hopefully uh, two minutes is enough to keep their attention and they actually listen to the message. So I would recommend you go to that and check that out. So that said, Ed, what do you think? Well, Chris, you either drove the point home very well and everybody understands it because at this point, we only have two questions. Ah, right, First well. question comes from Alex Banks. Hi, Chris. Nice to see you live again. Do you, know, do you know on average how many rollovers happen with fire apparatus a year in the USA? That's the first part of the question. I do not. Unfortunately, there is not a national database for fire apparatus or emergency vehicle crashes. Um, you could probably go to each state and drill down through their, uh, through their crash reporting systems to try and figure that out. Um, so Alex, California probably has a pretty squared away, I would think, crash reporting system that we could take a look at. But nationwide, I'm not familiar with a national database. I kind of keep an eye on it anecdotally through uh, the secret list and, you know, the various publications that send me uh, emails every day with news across the country. And the second part of the question is, do you see a decline or an increase year to year? Anecdotally, this year seems very bad for some reason. I, I don't know why. Um, but what I, what I will say is while rolling over is bad and we want to avoid that, I'm noticing there are less fatalities. And I think that comes down to guys finally listening to the seatbelt message, as well as an increase in some of the supplemental restraint systems you're seeing in the fire apparatus, the airbags, the, you know, pretensioners, all that stuff, um, as well as some increase in crash integrity for the cabs themselves. But again, that's just my speculation based on what I'm seeing anecdotally. Okay. And a question from your neck of the woods, Jack Sullivan. Do you- hey, Jack. Do newer fire apparatus have any kind of G-force indicator built in like a flashing light or buzzer? So a lot of the crash trucks have them that I have seen. Um, the custom trucks, the typical street trucks, we'll call them, I have not seen anybody have them on there. Uh, if I had my say on an NFPA committee, <laughs> I know people aren't fond of more standards, but that would be a requirement for both the driver and the officer side. I think it'd be very useful. What I will tell you, though, and a lot of the classes that I teach uh, this module at at different fire departments, I recommend to them you can go on eBay and you can buy a G meter that'll suction cup onto your windshield for not that much money, plug into the cigarette lighter. Um, and that's just as useful. The other option, and I recommend this when we talk about driver training on this topic, you can actually download a G meter to your cell phone. And for driver trainers, I recommend you, you download that to your cell phone, put it on the officer side of the truck, have the driver trainee sit there and watch as you drive. And they can see that lateral G-force, longitudinal G-force, increase, decrease, depending on what the truck's doing. Having said that, don't watch this video and say, Daly said we can take it up to 0.49 before we flip over and try and get there. No, 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 no. I know how firefighters are. Don't do that. Like I said, keep it under 0.2 and you should be good. If you want to get guys up to a higher G-force, and I do recommend that, I recommend reaching out, and I know you guys aren't going to want to hear this, but to your police EVOC instructors who drive police cars during their EVOC classes where you can get up into those higher G-forces more safely um, and give the drivers an opportunity to feel 0 0.4, 0 0.5 G rather than a curve. Not so they strive to achieve that, but so they understand what it feels like in a low center of gravity vehicle. So. It's a good question. Next question is from Stephen Zahn. I hope I pronounced the last name correctly. And the, and, and, uh, it, the question is, is the, the video available so we can show it to our drivers? And Stephen, the answer to that question is yes. Uh, we will be loading, uploading this presentation to the Provident YouTube, uh, YouTube site, which will be available here in the links at the end of the program. Uh, let's see, Chris, we have a couple of more that just popped in. 
Uh, Robert Timko, do wet conditions increase rollover incident? So that's a good question. And that's where the next level of this would involve the friction circle. On a slick road, depending on how slick the road is and what type of vehicle you're driving, you may actually break traction before you roll over. Usually you'll see that on a snow covered road. The problem is, as all of you guys know, we drive fire trucks on 12 foot lanes. So once that back end kicks out and starts to yaw around on you, it will usually hit that soft shoulder and then trigger what we call a tripped rollover where that back end sinks into the soft shoulder and the truck flips itself over. So yes, it's not uncommon to see a rollover as a result of a wet road uh, that triggered a trip roller. And that is why when we talk about the friction circle, we talk about the importance of slowing down on a slick highway and understanding uh, that concept. Okay, I believe we answered this one earlier. Same question, do, do any fire apparatus have T-force warning systems when the comfort zone begins to be exceeded? I believe we answered that one earlier with an earlier question. What are your thoughts on, this is from Paul Witt, by Mayor. What are you, Paul, what, are your what are your thoughts on vehicle stability safety systems? Most new trucks won't let you drive aggressively. So that again is something, I hate to keep saying this, but we do talk about ESCs in, uh, in the full module. Those ESCs will sense the truck starting to lose control. It knows where you want to go because it knows where your steering wheel is pointed. It knows where the truck is actually trying to go because it has what's called an accelerometer in the black box. So it knows where it's actually going and where you, it thinks you want it to go. And it will start to activate the ABS, reduce the throttle, et cetera, to try and get the truck back in line. That's great in theory. The problem is why we're still seeing crashes with new vehicles. And this doesn't just apply to fire trucks. It applies to everything because it is still possible to overdrive that system. And you have to remember, it takes time for that ECS to kick in, that electronic stability control to kick in. And if you're driving too aggressively, it won't have time to save you before you're hitting that soft shoulder and rolling over. So it depends on the situation. ESC is helpful, but it's not, unfortunately, the end all be all. All right. Thanks, Chris. The next question is from Michael Brown. Are there any differences in rollover potential for commercial versus custom cab apparatus? I don't know specifically, that's a good question. And that is kind of gonna come down to the fact that most fire trucks are custom built. So it all depends. I, I, you'd be hard, you almost have to tilt test every fire truck when it comes off the line because every fire truck's gonna be just a little bit different. Um, as far as custom versus you know, commercial, I don't know of any significant differences. When you look at the slides we looked at, um, that type three wildland pump was an international, I believe it's an international, not to use manufacturers, but that is what I would kind of characterize as a, as a commercial chassis. And it fell right in line with the slide before it, which was a custom chassis. So 0. 0.5 to 0. 0.6 is a pretty good ballpark regardless. Okay, great. Next question is from Ed Rush. In your full class research, do you address response procedures regarding when to respond lights and sirens and when to respond non-emergency? So that is a very controversial topic. And uh, I typically leave that up to the fire department to argue that amongst themselves. Uh, you know, obviously if you're not running lights and sirens, um, you're gonna take a little bit longer to get there. There've been a ton of studies done. We talk about that when I do the lights and sirens module, the difference in a suburban setting has been shown to be around 47 seconds, give or take. Um, so as I always say, should the fourth out piece of apparatus on a commercial fire alarm be running lights and sirens to save 47 seconds? I always end with that is an argument I will leave up to you guys to discuss. But does excess speed lead to rollovers? Yes. Do lights and sirens sometimes lead to excess speed? Yes. So they do go kind of hand in hand. I know that's kind of a cop out as an answer, but that's a procedural question that I leave to the fire departments. All right. Thanks, Chris. Next question is from Eva Parker. We're doing driver's training in the next six to eight weeks. Is there any way to do a class like this at our weekly drill? So if you go to this courses, and I realize this is a plug, but it is what it is. The courses.drivetosurvive.org, my entire eight-hour program is pretty much on that website. And if your fire department is interested in hosting it, reach out. You can get coupon codes for your members. The coupon codes will allow them to log in 
take the course at the end, they'll get a certificate they can present to your driver trainer coordinator. And then I leave it to you guys to take it from there and, and do the hands-on stuff. Um, so it is available at that courses.drivetosurvive.org. And that book on the right from Fire Engineering is a textbook that we wrote to go with hand in hand that program. So unfortunately right now, as far as in-person classes, depending on where you're at, they're few and far between. I've been on a hiatus, which is why I put everything online. I'll be the first to tell you, online is not the same as in-person. You lose my charm, uh, but it is what it is under the current situation. And, 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 and I'm sure our listeners can tell by now that the in-person pres in presentation with Chris would be very lively. Uh, he, he makes it very entertaining. He keeps you engaged the entire time you're there. Uh, we, we have a question here from Tom. I don't want to ignore anybody. I believe we answered this one earlier. Do rollover protection systems reduce engine speed on rounding curve at certain speeds help with rollovers? And I believe you answered that one pretty much earlier. Uh, they may help, but they're not the answer to everything. Correct. All right. All right, so this, this one looks like a technical question. Steve Smith, what is the effect of negative camber? I, I guess it's turns on these numbers. I think it's turns. So if I'm understanding the question of negative camber on the turns, if you're referring to the actual bank or super elevation of the road, and I don't know if he can jump in and say if that's what he's talking about or not. So as far as camber and tow for tires again that's something that i would have to say tilt test the truck to determine if there's an effect if you're talking about camber or super elevation or the road there are some roads and if you looked at that Stroudsburg road slide that i showed and actually i could probably pull it back up if you're still seeing my screen you can see the road is kind of sloped from the left to the right outward against the curve that's not a good idea that slight super elevation can reduce vehicle stability because now your vehicle shifted, if I'm making sense. I know I'm, I'm pointing at my camera here backwards, but if the road is sloped the wrong way, normally if you can think of a racetrack, it's sloped the other way. And that allows those guys to take the curve at a higher speed because you're essentially driving into the bank and that increases your ability to take that curve at a, at a higher G-force. Did I answer your question? Steve, if you want to pop something in here into the questions, we'll go on to the next question. And I think we're coming up here. It's uh, uh, He went on to say lack of super elevation on the road. Yes. Again, so, yes. And that is not uncommon for us to go to a, like a, a curve. We go to crashes all the time. And when I start looking at the curve, you start to say to yourself, they banked the road the wrong way. And as I said, if you can imagine a NASCAR track, it's banked, you know, low side to the infield. And that allows you to drive into that, that bank and you could take it at a higher a G force. That's on a racetrack. Don't go out and start looking at your banks and say, well, I could take this thing at 50 instead of 17 miles an hour. But a road design issue could be if it's a negative super elevation, as you can kind of see here. I don't know if you can see my cursor on your guys end, but it's kind of sloping away the wrong way. Okay. All right. We're going to finish up with a comment, not so much a question from Norm Oval from the city of Pittsburgh. Great job today, Chris and Ed. Excellent presentation that, that all should hear who drive emergency vehicles. Here at the Pittsburgh Bureau of Fire, our crash reports are being from being rear-ended and our apparatus driver striking stationary objects. Knock on wood, we've had a very safe record for non- and emergent response crashes with 28 engines, 11 trucks, four battalion chiefs, and 4,500 plus runs a year. I don't remember an, an apparatus rollover in the last past 38 years here. So good. Uh, well, that's good to hear, Norm. And uh, striking stationary objects, uh, that's part of a driver's training program. I don't know that vehicle dynamics have a lot to do with that. Uh, but we're going to finish with the questions there. I don't see any more in the queue. Um, hey, actually, Chris yep. and Ed, we have a few questions in the chat box if, if we want to look there, too. Uh, Arthur Howell just asked, at what speed does the typical driver start to lose control when not seatbelted? At what speed? Say that again. 
yeah, at what speed does the typical driver start to lose control when not seat belted? I don't know if I could necessarily answer that. Uh, the speed at which you're going to lose control or break traction with the road in a regular car is going to depend on curve radius, uh, the road conditions, how sticky the road is. Um, so it, it, I, I hate to not answer the question, but it kind of all depends on how sharp the curve is, what the road conditions are. There are some arguments that if you're not properly seat belted, you could come out of position, especially in a large fire truck where you're in an air ride suspension seat. You hit a pothole, and if you guys have driven newer apparatus and you don't lock that seat down, you've had it happen where you bounce up and come down. Uh, I recall having my foot come off the accelerator and brake pedal in a newer truck once or twice until you figured out you had to lock the seat in. So I know that's not really an answer, but it kind of depends on road conditions and the, and the sharpness of the curve. Great. Okay, one last question we're going to take. Any thoughts on skid truck or skid car training? Sure. If you can afford one and you can find a place to do it, go for it. I, I would say absolutely. Unfortunately, you know, not to uh, not to sound bitter because I'm not. It's just you build giant tactical villages and, and put all sorts of props in with natural gas. But nobody has a giant EVOC pad where you can do cool stuff. So sadly, EVOC is not prioritized. But if you can find a large area and you have the money to buy yourself one of those uh, I forget what they're called, skid car systems. That'd be awesome. All right, Chris, if you want to turn, uh, quit sharing your yep. view, then we're going to wrap things up here. We're coming up on that golden hour. My thanks to everyone. If you have any questions, let me know. And then uh, I'll turn it back over to you. Thank you, Chris. First of all, I want everybody to know that, that this was our first webinar with Chris. Uh, his Drive to Survive book, if you haven't had an opportunity, we're going to plug it here in a little bit. There are, I think, 26 chapters in that book. Obviously, we just scratched the surface with vehicle dynamics and vehicle rollovers. Uh, we're going to do additional webinars with Chris going forward on uh, other areas of the book. Uh, if you have a specific topic that you might want Chris to address, I'll give you information here shortly that you can send us an email and we'll work with Chris to try to meet your request. So having said all that, Chris, I want to thank you for a very informative presentation. From attending your Drive to Survive training program and reading your book, I know there's a lot more to learn. I believe we set the stage for our listeners to pursue additional training beyond the standard EVOC course. And I'm not bashing EVOC courses. I'm an EVOC instructor. Uh, but there's more to it than what we get in a 16-hour EVOC class. Uh, Chris, if you want to tell us how our listeners can take it, well, we've already done that. Uh, you had your slide up, and we're going to provide that information uh, as well. So for all of you who registered for the webinar, we'll be emailing the links to you for the discount codes to, to get Chris's book and the training programs. We'll also be uploading this presentation to our Provident YouTube page. If you'd like to watch it again or share it, please do. Uh, and as a reminder, there'll be a very short five-question survey at the end of the program. Please take the time to complete it so you can help us going forward with additional programs. Uh, if you have any questions or need additional resources uh, from today or you have an idea for a future webinar, please email us at info at providentins.com and we'll get back to you as soon as we can. This wraps up Providence Maiden Voyage into Webinars. Join us in May for a webinar on recruiting and retention with first arriving Tiger Schmittendorf. We'll share the registration, registration link to this event in our email with all of you. Until then, stay healthy and stay safe. Thanks for joining us.